There are some industries which have always been at the heart of Factory Berlin. Mobility is certainly one of them. Newton Davis joins us now to moderate our first Future of Urban Mobility conversation. He's a Berlin-based European Partnership Manager for Mobility Data and a Factory Berlin member. Mobility Data aids in the development and adoption of mobility specifications by providing technical know-how and tools. Enjoy. It's really exciting to have this opportunity to moderate this panel and we're really excited to talk about mobility. Um, as we discussed in a little bit of the, the introduction, where we'll be speaking a, a lot about bicycles, but we want to broaden that out to talk about micromobility options as well. Obviously, everyone is aware of the situation that we find ourselves in right now. Many of you are watching online um, behind your own screens because of the COVID pandemic. And we know that that pandemic also gave us lots of opportunities to think about how we move, or rather how we might not move, um, in terms of our own mobility. And because of that, we've seen lots of changes in the way that people choose to move around. Personal transport, especially active mobility, has seen a huge increase. Um, we saw last year record sales of, of e-bikes across Europe and across the United States. Some are expecting that this year, almost 20% of all bikes sold in, the, in Europe will be, will be electric. And we think that, obviously, that is a huge testament to the way that active mobility and active transport are, are becoming more of a part of the way that we think about our own urban mobility transportation. Obviously, environmental challenges abound, and, and the promise of electric vehicles and the, the promise of, of, of cleaner transportation is one that many of us see as being a, a key to, to solving some of our climate, changes, climate change issues, but those alone aren't enough. We know that people need to get out of their cars, get on their feet, get onto bikes, get onto public transportation options for us to really find ways to solve that. So hopefully within the confines of this panel today, we'll have an opportunity to talk about the ways in which bicycles might stand as an as a interesting point for us to think about uh, how we might change our own personal mobility. And obviously with bicycles, we, we think about our more traditional types, but we can think about those new forms of, of mobility that fall into the category of micromobility, such as scooters, electric mopeds, kick scooters, and, and all the other form factors that are hitting our streets across the world. Um, so with that said, I want to introduce this illustrious panel that we have here today, um, comprised of many mobility experts that can help us think about uh, these challenges here. So first, I'm going to introduce Pertu. Pertu is our uh, expert here, who is uh, from Radbon Berlin and has been working diligently to think about infrastructure. We also have Harry, who's joining us from ITS Hamburg, who's giving us an opportunity to think really des think about uh, the future of, of, of mobility from a perspective of a policy at a very high level. And finally, we have Prabhin, who is coming, joining us from Bond Mobility, which is an e-bike manufacturer um, and, and service provider that can give us the opportunity to think about how, how e-bikes might, might play a big role in the way that urban mobility challenges might be solved. I want to start this panel by, by asking everyone sort of how they arrived here today, um, what form of mobility they used to get here, um, and to give us a little bit of an introduction as to, to who they are and what they do. With that, I'll turn it over to, to, to Pertu. So today, um, I first took a taxi <laughs> to this uh, Hauptbahnhof in Berlin. Unfortunately, I was, uh, I was running a bit late, so I decided not to not to take the, the public transport, and then I came here by train. That's how I got here today. And what about Harry? Yes, normally when I'm not here in the digital way, I arrive in Hamburg uh, by train. It's a normal way to go from Braunschweig, where I still live, uh, to Hamburg. It's a train journey every day. Uh, it takes about two hours for one uh, single trip. And in Hamburg, using the uh, underground or Moya, because it's a really uh, attractive service uh, to go from one point to another with a mobile, uh, with an electric uh, car. And what about you, Prabhat? How, how did you arrive to, to where you are today, or, or what's your normal form of transportation? Um, I'm unfortunately confined at home because of COVID, uh, but normally uh, I, I'm between Brussels and, and Zurich. So in Brussels, fortunately, we have a very good public transit system. So most of the time, it's either public transit or walking. And when I'm in Zurich, of course, I mean, uh, I, I use our bond bikes and uh, public transit. So that's that's my mobility mix. So 
we see that there's a number of ways that we got here today. Um, I didn't do any of your introductions justice, so I'd like for you all to give us a little bit of insight as to you know who you are and what you work on. I'm gonna go in reverse order. Propin, can you can you give us a some insight onto Bond and and what your role is there? So uh, Bond Mobility is a speed e-bike sharing company. We started around 2015. And uh, if you go to Zurich and, and also in, in Hamburg, we have a couple of hundred bikes in the streets uh, for users to use. And uh, speed e-bikes are a specific category uh, among e-bikes where you have support till 45 kilometers per hour. And, and normal classic e-bikes, you, you have support till 25 kilometers per hour. Uh, so we are currently operating in in, uh, in Hamburg and Zurich, and uh, I'm the CTO of the company. Wonderful. And Harry, can you give us some insight on to, to ITS World Congress and, and ITS Ham Germany? Yes, of course. So ITS stands for Intelligent Transport Systems and Services as well. So quite important, not only the infrastructure and products, but also the mobility as, as a service activities are involved. And uh, Germany, as a city of Hamburg, as a host, uh, has got the positive response from Ertico from Brussels to have these uh, special event as World Congress on Mobility and Services in October this year. And uh, the city of Hamburg has established a known company to prepare and to operate this uh, Congress. And I'm the CEO of this uh, external ITS Hamburg 2021 company to do exactly so. Wonderful. And Pertu? So I'm one of the co-founders of a project called Radbahn in the center of Berlin, taking place under and along neglected uh, iconic uh, metro line, elevated metro line U1. And, and we started the project with the idea of converting the space into a nine kilometer long covered bicycle lane. And now we are talking about bicycle park with the idea of, of creating the space, which is about social inclusion, social togetherness, creating a pay a place for people to cycle, but also to get together and enjoy urban life together um, in social setting. Wonderful. And so my, to, to, to get this conversation, I'm kind of curious to ask everyone, What's your vision of urban mobility um, and, you know, in an ideal form, what would that look like for, for the cities that you all spend the most time in? Uh, we'll start with you, Pertu. So I think the biggest issue that we now face in the cities is the fact that um, city space is so unequally divided. Uh, out of urbanites, maybe 30-40% actually have a car, but then the cars are consuming the free city space. Like uh, in, in street level, they take 60-70% of the space. And an ideal scenario for me would be that there's a better inclusion, it's more equal, um, all, dif all different mobility needs would be met, it would be less polluting, uh, it would be safer, and, and also some sort of social connection between people would be so much nicer. Uh, nowadays, everyone is just trying to get a bigger and more expensive car and, and they are sitting in their massive uh, metallic tank by themselves and feel zero connection to other people around them. So I would like to envision this urban environment where, where all different forms of mobility are supported and, and there's much less private car ownership. Uh, people are cycling, people are walking, maybe using different forms of micro-mobility and, and also kind of understanding that there are other people in the same space, that we are here together. Not that I'm here in my car by myself, but I'm together with other people. And what about you, Prabhin? What's your ideal form of, of urban mobility? Petro said it really, really well. Uh, but just to add to that, uh, I envision a city where uh, you have multiple mobility options, right? And and uh, it's not just putting, uh, you know, a vision to the city as such. Uh, no matter you have multiple mobility options, users have to make a shift towards conscious consumption as well. What I mean by that is users making conscious choices of uh, you know mobility options for example going to a grocery store maybe you don't have to take a car you 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 can take a bike right so uh, it's it's a shift that i envision not just for the city but for the people that are part of the city as well wonderful but last and not least harry from the from from your perspective what's ideal so uh, I've seen a lot of activities of mobility uh, all around the world. I think it's also relating to the uh, to the public and to the infrastructure and the actual status. What what stage of mobility is already established? So in Europe, there's another kind of mobility uh, needed. Then we have to look in uh, South Africa or uh, Asia Pacific area or the U.S. And that's exactly the the challenge we have to look 
look in also for the World Congress to see what can we do. And most important is not to look really only for the techniques and the products. It's more important to look to the people, what they would like to, to get. And it must be really an easy way to go from A to B and not only for the people, but also for the goods. Uh, and in Hamburg, of course, we have a real logistic uh, activity with the harbor worldwide. And so you have to combine the infrastructure. You have to see what you can do and you have to do with these logistics aspects, also so the city logistics, and then you have to combine it with the people and the people movement to make it quite easy. That's the, the common view and we have to see the best the solutions to, to stick together. And the, I think quite important is that the uh, political and the governmental side is quite be able to bring out the special rules and the specifications to make all these uh, activities happen. That is really interesting. And I, and I think that you hit on a lot of really, really good points in that mobility, obviously, is something that we all experience very differently depending on where you live. Um, we sit here from the beautiful place of Hamburg. I, you all can't see the outside, but it is quite nicer sitting right here on the water. Uh, many of us live in Berlin or in other parts of Europe where access to infrastructure is really, really you know, easy and, and, quite, and quite, uh, quite nice. And so when you think about the urban mobility landscape around the world, you recognize that many cities may not have that the same capacity to be able to provide infrastructure that is um, clean and safe for its users. And, and I think that points us directly to our, what, my, what I hope to bring in this next conversation is, you know, what is the infrastructure that's sort of missing from the context? And I know we all, we sit here from Europe, but we have a global audience out there. You know, what are, what are some of the things um, that, that we need in terms of infrastructure that make this vision that Prabhin um, and that Pertu and that you, Harry, lay out, what makes that possible? And, and Pertu, as, as someone who's coming from, from the perspective of really trying to make that infrastructure happen, I'd love to get your opinion on this first. I think it's a matter of prioritization. Um, as long as you prioritize cars as, as the first thing to be thought in an urban space, then the outcome is that you have more cars and you have more people driving cars. If you start it the other way around and start privatizing, for example, bicycles and pedestrians, then you build infra that is very safe for everyone, including the car drivers, actually. Uh, there will be less space for cars, but it's certainly more open and more inclusive, more inviting um, to cycle also for those people who don't feel safe to cycle at the moment. And it's also extremely important that, for example, women who have kids feel that it's safe to cycle because then the kids are also cycling later on in their lives. It's normally much more difficult for people to pick up cycling if they don't have any, any kind of experience with it. So um, we would need to definitely build infra that is focusing first on other options of mobility and not, uh, not cars. Wonderful. And I, I want to sort of ask you, thinking about the work that Radban is doing, you know, are there other examples of in infrastructure like that or, or prioritization of, of, of thinking about infrastructure that you've seen that have been um, helpful for, for, for cities who want to get, you know, maybe more women or more children on bikes or, and make it more accessible? Have you, have you seen examples of that? Well, I guess when we, when we talk about cycling, we always use the same examples, Amsterdam and Copenhagen, but in the end of the day, they are very good examples. And, and it's not true, but many people here, for example, feel that we would never be next Copenhagen or we will never be Amsterdam because it's a completely different story. It's actually not a completely different story. They had the same situation there as we have here now, uh, still in the 60s and 70s, and then people started to understand that we need to do something. We don't have space for these cars anymore. People are dying, kids are dying, air is polluted. And that's how the change begin. And in Copenhagen now, for example, bicycle is the first uh, thing to be considered when you're building new infra. You start with the bicycles and then you solve all the issues related to bikes and what's left is then left for the cars. I think that's a really interesting point. And Harry, I want to I want to hear your perspective on this. You know, given that you work at such a high level um, with with lots of government bodies um, and lots of think tanks around the world who are who are really trying to solve these issues, what have you seen from a policy perspective around infrastructure that you think um, is helpful for for achieving this vision that we laid out at the beginning of of this world of of urban mobility focused on bikes and active transportation? 
Yes, of course, the first step could be and should be the infrastructure, so, so build up the the the, uh, the bike lanes and so on, uh, as you already mentioned for, for Copenhagen, and I've seen because it was the last World Congress uh, took place in Copenhagen, and as, of course, it was a focus for the bicycles, bicycles and what to do with them. Uh, but I think it's not only the infrastructure to, to give the space for the bikes, it's also to make sure that the data platform is a kind of a infrastructure to be sure that you can offer special services to go from one bike to a, to a public transport or to keep your bike with you with the tra transport uh, uh, public transport systems and then go outside again and then you must get the services and you must get also all the data and I think it's a quite important point to summarize all these uh, data you can uh, you can conduct uh, to offer them to other services also for, for new use cases and for new services I think it's also kind of infrastructure and I've seen a lot of um, different uh, solutions in very um, special infrastructures uh, areas and and, and cities and I think Hamburg is going really well to build up these new lanes uh, to reduce also the streets and the roads for the cars because there was a shift of uh, mobility and then you have also to offer and to conduct and to get up with a platform for all these new data so it's quite important to offer them to other services. That's interesting. Robin, I want to get your take on this as someone who is trying to provide these services. What role does infrastructure play in the decisions that you all make about where you put um, your new offerings for, for, for cities? Um, th there's a very, very iconic picture of a uh, street in Brussels where um, it, uh, it's a picture taken at the times when we had horse-drawn carriages. And if you look at the the, the space allocated for bicycles and uh, and pedestrians it was it was pretty wide right and then in 1920s 30s we had cars coming in and and the space allocated for pedestrians and bicyclists was very very small right and and uh, if, if and, and after that we didn't see much change uh, happening but uh, what i what we see is that cities are stepping up to put uh, protected b uh, bicycle lanes and and uh, the cities where we go to, cities where uh, there are pro protected bicycle lanes, we definitely see uh, more users uh, switching to active uh, mode of mobility. And, and we also do prioritize cities where there is uh, protected bike, bicycle lanes. Right? And, and th that, that makes a whole lot of difference. If you, if you look at Paris, they added 50 kilometers of uh, protected bicycle lanes last year. And, and you see that the overall ridership went up by like about 65 percentage. Same in Brussels. They added something like 40 kilometers of protected bicycle lanes. And, and we had uh, 40 percentage more usage of uh, bicycles. So, uh, you know, infrastructure absolutely plays a role. Previously, there was a thought that you know, maybe there's no demand, so we don't have to have this infrastructure. But this, this entire uh, thesis is changing. If you Put, in, put proper infrastructure, people would definitely switch to active mobility. In your role from a commercial perspective, do you often find that uh, you, you, when talking to cities about putting in your service, that, that that's something that they talk about with you? Is like, you know, are, are there, you know, do you find that you have to sort of push that or, or are they pretty willing and, and able to accept the fact that, that that's necessary for, for not only your business, but also for citizens? Um, if you look at 2018-19, that's, that's the time that when I, when I got into micromobility as such, it was uh, th these micromobility companies pushing cities saying that, hey, you know, we definitely have to have this infrastructure in place. But, uh, you know, with, with all the bad effects of COVID, one positive thing is that cities are changing their perspective. Right? right now, it is like, you know, we see cities talking about it rather than micromobility companies having to push that to cities. Right. So that's a, that's a dramatic shift that happened in 2020. And from, from that perspective, you talked a lot about uh, how these bike lanes, you saw percentages increase in terms of, of your ridership. Um, amongst your peers, do you, do you find that that's also been, you know, pretty, pretty standard amongst uh, those in, in, during the COVID times and with, with the increase in a lot of the lanes and, and the, the kilometers and mileage that people have for bike lanes? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, if you look at 2000, early, early uh, 2020, when COVID hit, we had lockdowns and everything. So, you know, overall ridership went down for, for most of the mobility operators, right? But then in, in, if, you, if you look at uh, Paris, uh, about uh, mid last year, we saw that bicycling uh, went really high. And if you, if you look at 
uh, some numbers from from this uh, data company called Fluxio that that releases uh, data uh, pretty often, we absolutely see a spike in usage. Uh, j- just in Zurich, we saw that our the the the, the average distance traveled was much higher uh, post COVID than than pre COVID times. So so we absolutely see a spike. But though I mean uh, because there's not much movement that did have an impact. But when things get normal, uh, it's going to be a very different story. That's true. That's true. I think it's really interesting that we both hear from from Prabhan and and Harry about this idea of of data as being a really critical part of the infrastructure. And obviously, from my perspective, sitting as um, the Community and Partnerships Manager for Mobility Data, we're really concerned with how uh, the infrastructure of, of data is 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 used and and shared amongst uh, amongst operators as well as cities. Um, but ultimately, we're we're curious. And, and interested in making sure that travelers have that that the best experience possible. And so, as a nonprofit, we really focus on that. I'm I'm curious from from the perspective of the panel, um, you know, are we focusing enough on data infrastructure? And and what's missing from from that conversation about uh, the way that we handle mobility data for micro mobility? Um, and and as Harry alluded to, those connections to public transportation. You know, I- is that conversation really deep enough amongst? Um, you know, uh, amongst the people that are, are required to make decisions about it. And I, and I like to start with you, Harry. Uh, thanks a lot, because uh, exactly in Hamburg now, since I think maybe 10 years, we are thinking about this issue uh, to go forward with a real laboratory uh, to test and to, to conduct all these new data, not only from cars, but also from bikes. So we have counting um, uh, gates to count the really traffic uh, coming up from bikes. We have a day by day monitoring system uh, in really dynamic online so you can see how many bikes are exactly just now on their way from a to b and so we also have um, uh, some additional assistant systems you can use as an app on your on your bike uh, to, to to say okay a little bit faster or a little bit slower to go really to the next crossing uh, and, and the traffic light without any stopping. So exactly the same services uh, will come up. We have in the car also for a bike uh, and a bicycle. Um, I think that's quite important. And we have also last uh, last week, uh, these uh, National Bike Congress established here in Hamburg. And we have saw a lot of, of, of these ideas. And we also will see with this topic a lot of uh, projects and new ideas during the ITS World Congress because bicycle is really a huge point also for the Congress, not only in Hamburg and not only national, it's really worldwide activities. I think it's quite important also to reduce the uh, CSI, uh, CO2 uh, um, climate activities. I think it's quite important the behavior of the people has to be changed, quite important. That's that that is spot on. I'm I'm curious now to sort of turn our, our attention a little bit more to thinking about how for how products and services might um, might be introduced that will allow us to to move towards this vision that we've laid out. Um, and I want to start with you, Peter. To like, what what do you think um, is missing in terms of of products? Um, and this is thinking more about digitalization. But what what products are missing that um, could be helpful in, in helping us transition from you know motor transport to, to more active forms of transport that include biking, walking, but also all of these other micro mobility options that have been emerging over the last few years. I guess one of the the issues is the safety topic. Um, people don't feel safe in in urban space when they cycle. Um, whether it's a product that is missing, in, in a way it is safety. Um, and then I think many of the people are just not informed. Um, although there would be product offerings for them, they just don't know about them and they don't know how to combine this all, all these different options into their daily behavior. Um, so I don't know if it's a product missing, but it's just something that is uh, missing for many people today, I believe. Um, and then in, in so many different cities, like uh, the belief is that um, by painting um, painting the pavement, we create bicycle infra, but that's not the case. It's actually much more, it's much broader. And you have to think about uh, uh, isolating the cyclist or like uh, giving them a different pace that is, uh, is not mixed with the cars. 
So that's also one topic and thing. Like in terms of technical innovation, um, I think the the e-bikes are getting there. Uh, and for many people who didn't cycle before, especially for elderly people, I know that it's it's a big thing. It kind of like makes it easier for them to to commute for longer distances. So uh, other than that, I don't know what to say. I'm 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 curious to get Robin's your perspective as a CTO, right? You're 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 creating these products, um, and you guys have e-bikes as as a core offering that you provide to 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 individuals in cities. You know what what are you seeing from the perspective of not only your business, but from the perspective of the wants and needs of customers um, as far as what products, both in terms of the digital products, but in your case, as well as physical products, you know, what, what kind of form factors are people also looking for in, in order to, to, to make this transition to our paradise of urban mobility that we've been talking about? Um, it's a very good question, and uh, it's a good question because us at Bond, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on product. And uh, if, if you look at bicycle as such, it, it has gone through quite a bit of transformation over the last uh, 100, more, more than 100 years, right? And uh, the last 10 years, there's a huge uh, transformation in terms of uh, moving from a classic bicycle to electrification and then making these bikes smart, right? And if you look at companies like OneMove and Cowboy, they are doing an amazing job in terms of building consumer uh, products. Right, uh, but if you look at shared uh, mobility options that we have in cities, I strongly believe that that, that we, we could do much better. I always say that uh, shared micro mobility deserves a better hardware, uh, because if you if you if you if you talk to investors or even if you if you've been if you talk to founders, all they talk about is like you know reducing the bomb cost, you know the, the total cost of the bike, which means that you know uh, get a bike at the lowest price point possible, put them in the street and, and people would use. And people would definitely use them because they don't have a better choice, right? Uh, we are trying to change that uh, by putting customer at the center. If you, I mean, uh, in, in Hamburg, if you, if you use one of our bond bikes, you will instantly feel that the ride quality is like on a, on a completely different scale than any other sharing bike that you would pick, right? And uh, I, I, I feel that uh, this, is what, this is something that is missing across the globe when it, uh, when it comes to shared mobility. And we've made that first move. And, and if you look at uh, the new, new uh, bike that we are coming up with, I pu put a picture on Twitter and Instagram. It's a, it's a bike that we are trying to, uh, uh, it's a bike that might bring more people to uh, using, bi using uh, an e a shared e-bike. Because if you look at, look at the shared e-bikes, there are two positions of uh, biking. One is like, you know, the forward facing, uh, 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 forward leaning uh, position of uh, uh, when you sit in a bike that's more sporty. And then uh, in, uh, if you look at uh, other bikes, you sit straight, right? So these are two different positions. And based on your preference, uh, you know, users pick different products based on that. And what we are trying to do is uh, in, uh, embed these two positions in the same bike by adjusting the handlebar and seat post automatically based on user preference. Right? This is something that we are working on. We have a prototype ready, and we, have, we hopefully we can get it uh, to the market. So this is something that we are doing. We also see that if you look at companies like Tier and Y and Dot and you know all these guys, they are also iterating on a very good products. For example, e-scooters. They've gone from you know these very uh, you know uh, fragile ES4 models that we saw in 2018 to what we see now, which which are which are on a much uh, on, on a completely different scale. Right. So what I see missing in shared mobility is very good product. And I think we, we are all uh, experimenting. We, it's, 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 uh, it's still a nascent industry and we're all experimenting. And I think in the, in the next couple of years, we'll not just see uh, these bikes and scooters, on a, a, a better quality scooters and bikes, but I think we'll also see different form factors like small pods or we don't know, try it, uh, you know, uh, some small vehicle with three wheels. Uh, I, I think many, many uh, new products are going to come into the market. To, to, go, to go back to like your, your product centered approach, I'm curious, are there, have there been a lot of feedback from, from your consumers about what, what kind of bike they'd like to see more of? You sort of talk about the two different positions that one can sit in, more sporty, one cruiser that I think we all associate more with the, the Nordics and, and the Netherlands. And, um, but is there anything that you've, you've seen in the research that you all have done as you've created products that, that sort of speaks to making it potentially more accessible, um, as Pertu was talking about earlier, for, for maybe women or for, for people with, with, with disabilities? Like, what, what have you seen in terms of, of product development for, for, for in, in that respect? 
So we have a very uh, peculiar set of users. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, the, the product that we have uh, is not for everybody, but uh, the, 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 the set of users that we have, what, it's like this, you know, if, if you go to a mall or a, or, a, or a metro station, you have an escalator, right? And, and you see people uh, normally stand in an escalator and there's another bunch of people who walk the escalator. Right, that's the persona that we have of, of, of users of Bond, right? And so what they like is more sporty bike, so you know forward leaning, uh, and and that's the majority. And and the the only reason that we are trying to shift to a, a bike that can that can have two modes on is like you know the sporty and, and a relaxed uh, seating position is because we also want to uh, you know include other uh, uh, users as well into this mix, right? But the the current user base. They, they they like the sporty uh, seating and that's what they, they ask for. That's that's really interesting. Harry, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, um, how how are then cities around the world taking in this information and this explosion of different kind of products and how are they regulating that? You know, what's what's the the best format in in terms of allowing for these new form factors, be they pods or tripods or scooters on the street? You know, what what what's what are best practices in, in that respect? I, I don't know that there is a best practice. So you have to see and you have to look what exactly the, the people would like to, to go forward. Uh, and it's uh, also a, a kind of evolution. Uh, when you talk about Copenhagen or Montreal, I've seen in Montreal a lot of bicycles and uh, a lot of systems already established. You can go uh, through Montreal with a bike quite easy. And so every city, or uh, same Hamburg um, as, as well, and, and uh, Amsterdam and Paris. So it's different. And from the p uh, perspective of a governmental side or city side, you must be open uh, to every system at first. And then you have to improve and you, you have to test. And then you have also to decide that uh, for everybody must be an option to go by bike from A to B. And some people, elder people would like to have another bike or another system, but it must be based on the same database. I think quite important to make it easy to go from one transport mode to the other to, to put your bike with you or to get your bike with you or to change it and get a new one uh, when you get out of the public transport or so, something like this. I think also quite important for tourists, not only for the people living in the city, tourists should be offered such a system as well and quite easy with a non-high um, need to, to uh, be intelligent and to have a lot of barriers to, to stick in and system, it must be quite easy. So I think it's also from, from Switzerland and from Zurich, it's quite easy to use these public transport and all these things with let's go. It was an app, now it's changed to another one, but uh, uh, the Switzerland is quite easy to use these new services. So for the World Congress, it's quite interesting because we have such a lot of um, uh, ideas and uh, products and companies who would like to, to show their products with special ideas. So we have to, to come up uh, at the Heiligen Geisfeld in an open area space uh, to, to rent a lot of uh, additional space to show no more than 19 really demonstrations and a lot of them are really bicycle activities so you can experience future mobility now so that's our slogan for the world congress uh, to expire uh, exactly what you can get and i think that's quite important to have a discussion with the people and then you can exactly show what is the best for the city and for the people where you live that's an interesting point i think what we're starting to get on here is really thinking about uh changing people's behavior. And that's always really difficult. I, I think when we, 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 we talk about, you know, infrastructure, which is a policy thing, we talk about sort of new products from, from a hardware perspective in terms of what people are actually riding. Um, but then there's this really big piece of, you know, the people, there's a societal element. Um, and we really haven't really explored that. And, and I'm kind of curious, Pedro, as someone who is sort of thinking about really changing the sort of the fabric of, of a city, the, the landscape, the infrastructure, you know, what's needed from that societal point? We've talked about safety. We've talked about, you know, the need for maybe new form factors. Um, but, but what's needed to sort of help push people along or help pull them? I mean, maybe it's not necessarily a push. Maybe it's a pull, but to pull them towards um, 
these forms of active transportation and using more sustainable micromobility options? Um, I believe that people are very smart in the end of the day. So if cycling, for example, is the best option they have to go from pay point A to point B, I think they would choose it. And this, um, whatever best option means, like it can be facilitated this decision by, by, for example, punishing or not punishing, but like making private car ownership relatively expensive or very difficult. If you don't have a parking place in front of your building, it's not very likely that you would have a car. And I think removing private car parking from the city centers, that would be a very nice step, or at least reducing it to, to quite a lot. Um, because in the end of the day, we all actually pay for this. Very few people are using it, and very few people have a chance to do it, and, and then we pay for it, like we all pay for these expenses as a society. Um, and I think the, the perception of cycling um, is changing already, um, especially in the cities. It's, it tends to be educated uh, people with, with nicely paid jobs who are cycling. Um, and I think over time, this change is going to, to go deeper, I believe, in the society. So like having a car, for example, it's not a status question anymore. Like many of the people would be able to buy it. They don't do it because they don't believe it makes sense. And this kind of trends that are taking place uh, will have this impact on people's minds as well. You and I had a really interesting conversation before before we got started here, um, where we were talking about how our, our own mobility options getting around the city, and we both we both sort of talked about how wonderful it is to use public transportation in Berlin, um, how much biking infrastructure there is, and and how much you know car sharing. There's so many options that one can use to get around, um, but it's really dependent on where you live in the city and where you're going in the city, um, and I think that it's really interesting that we sit here from a perspective of Europe, and I, I'm sure that we have many people out there from, from the US and other parts of the world who are joining who have you know, maybe not as many options. Um, I think about my hometown, where uh, you know, my home school was about uh, t two kilometers, three kilometers away from my house, and in the seven years that I went to school there, I never biked to school once, always in a private car. And now from this perspective, I think back and I'm like, oh wow, that was crazy. I, I could have walked to school in 30 minutes, but it just never occurred to me that that was something that I could do. Um, so I, I really think that, you know, in Europe, obviously, there's a lot more of a an, an openness to biking, and cities are much denser um, and allows for people to sort of move around in a way that's conducive for these micromobility options. But what do we do in these places where, where you know, biking and walking could be more of an option, but there just really isn't that that sort of precedent for it? Um, and, I, and I'm curious because, you know, it's easy for us to sit here, like I said, in Europe and be like, okay, everyone needs to get on a bike when we can, you know, have many options to get there and biking is just one of them. But what about these places where there is no public transportation system or, you know, everyone has their own car? You know, how do we really, again, it's, it's I don't want to say push because it can always be forceful, but how do we also pull people onto, onto wanting to use these forms? Harry, it sounded like you had something that you wanted to add there. So I want to start with you there. Yes, I would like to mention exactly a point you just uh, um, mentioned, because we will present a special project uh, supporting by a non-profit organization in, in, located in Hamburg uh, to South Africa, because in South Africa it could be an opportunity uh, to uh, have with a bike a special uh, use case not only for your own but also for service uh, with people and also for logistic aspects and this company uh, will provide a special electromobility uh, with bikes uh, um, produced in India and with micro credits uh, they will make possible that a lot of people can own such a bike and really establish their own business in such an area without any car. So, uh, of course, you have to build up an infrastructure as well for the e-bike, and you have to make sure that with solar panels you are able to do so. But there's really a special idea in a special region with special uh, um, uh, challenges, and uh, we will see what we can do and what we can provide uh, also during our World Congress to discuss exactly this topic with a lot of people to make and uh, to, to come up with the best. On the other side, in, um, in, in Hamburg, uh, 
I think we have also a lot of uh, additional things and we have to inform the quality uh, about the quality of such a system to the people to make sure that a lot of people will change from car to bike because then they don't have to do their sports at the end of the day. They can do the sporting activities during the morning and during the, the afternoon or the evening when they go uh, to work or come back at home. They are already then one hour with their bike uh, with sporting activities. So I think that's quite important to change this behavior and then we can also change and reduces CO2 uh, consumption. Prabhat, I want to get you in on this as well. How, how are you all thinking about going past sort of these early adopters that are, you know, eager to hop on these bond bikes when they show up in cities to thinking about pushing, you know, towards those people who might be a little bit more hesitant? And what pitch, you know, obviously you guys have to, you have business that you need to do, but like what pitch are you all thinking about putting forward to make that more attractive, um, to change people's behaviors, to want them to get on, maybe not, they're not biking themselves, they're not pushing themselves, you know, for 30 minutes, but because they're using your e-bikes, they're, they're actually getting a sort of a, a, a double experience of, of getting a little bit of a push, but also doing some of that active transport as well. How, what, what's the pitch that you all are making for, for maybe those who are a bit hesitant? It is it is very difficult getting uh, new users on board. But uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to say something which is very relatable. It's a journey that I went through. So uh, you know, if you if you many many of us would have gone through this uh, physical fitness transformation, right? Where there was a point in life when we when we were uh, living on pizza and 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 all fast food, right? And then at one point we felt no, I mean this, this is terrible, and I really want to get in shape and and live healthy. And then what we did was we put effort in trying to understand what nutrition is. You know, we went to an extent of even calculating macros, right, uh, counting calories, right. And then we made a transformation. And then after you make that transformation, you you live healthy and then you eat clean. Right? That's, that's a behavioral change, a conscious change. Right, This is a journey that I went through. And, and a second journey that I went through is uh, when I was living in India about uh, you know, eight, nine years ago, uh, my goal was to buy a car. And, and uh, the, mo the f first time I got a good salary, uh, what I did was I bought a car. And, 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 my, and my next goal was buying a car with a big cylinder. Right? That, that, that was the goal because I, was, I, I didn't know, I didn't have this... Uh, you know, uh, knowledge that I have today about uh, CO2 emissions and, and the impact that we that, that it has, right? And uh, I went through a journey where I said, okay, fine, you know, maybe uh, I should think about my mobility options and then, you know, shifted my behavior. And, and that was also a conscious journey about, about thinking about what impact am I making? You know, do I really have to take my car for a grocery shopping spree or should I just walk? Or should I take a bike, right? So you know, it's it's a it's a it's a conscious uh, transformation that I went through, and and I always advocate that all of us have to go through this journey, and uh, you know, trying to understand why we make these choices and what better choice that we can make. You know, if, if you look at Netherlands, and and we all say that you know uh, Dutch love bicycles, it's bicycles everywhere, right? And and uh, what we say is that just buy a bicycle, everything will be all right. But actually, that's not, not uh, true. I mean, I have a lot of friends in the Netherlands. And if you look at the Netherlands, the number of cars are very, very high. I mean, if you look at uh, cars per uh, thousand people or, or a million people, it's, it's very high. But then what they are uh, good at is picking the right mobility option for the right job to be done. Right? We're not trying to copy that. What we are trying to copy is just buy bikes, which is not going to make any difference. Right? So if we, if we all educate ourselves in making this you know, behavioral change, I think, I think uh, we'll be in a better place. I love I love that idea of thinking about the jobs to be done. I think that's an extremely good framework for for introducing this urban mobility paradigm. Harry, you've mentioned a few times this idea of logistics, and I think that as we think about what role transportation plays in our life and what we're actually using transportation on for a daily basis, being able to separate out those functions that might exist, right? You know, going to school, or going to work is very different than going to the grocery store. That's very different than going to Ikea to pick up something that you've purchased or getting furniture delivered. And so each one of those things, you know, while we might, right, right now, you know, we're, we're kind of taught that having a, a car is the way that you solve all those things. Um, really what we could do is kind of what they're saying in the micromobility industry I, uh, is, you know, de, de, decouple or debundle de the car, right? And that you can use these various different micromobility options to be able to serve these different functions. And, and I think that, you know, as we think about moving and encouraging people to move on to uh, more active forms of transport is really, I think, making it clear 
where are there opportunities for people to really sort of pinpoint um, changes that aren't necessarily affecting their whole life? We're not saying, hey, you need to ride your bike to go get groceries, but maybe think about, you know, riding your bike to go to church or riding your bike uh, to drop your kid off at school because you may not need to carry that many things. Um, we're getting to the end of our conversation, and I, I want to ask of all the panelists um, sort of one question that has two parts, and it's really about uh, a call to action. Um, I, I always like to sort of end these, these talks with, with getting an understanding of where people see themselves um, and, and, and where they see there being the, the real immediate opportunities for change. And so I want to ask each one of you um, to, 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 for a call to action for both cities and governments that are responsible for, for creating policies and, and hopefully putting in infrastructure, but also to individuals um, to make uh, a change. And the, the question is like, what is that one thing that you would ask of, a, of city governments, um, of our governments in general, to do to move us in the direction that we need? And what's the one thing that you would ask each individual to do uh, to, to move us in that change? And I'll, I'll start with Harry. Thanks a lot for this. So for the governmental side, it's quite easy. You must come up with a really clear roadmap, what you can do and what you will do uh, to build up this infrastructure. We already mentioned uh, with all these things, with clear steps. So you have a valid situation for everybody. We can have some clear basements and structures for business cases, for new investments, uh, for new companies to bring up exactly this new bicycle world also quite in place. And it's not only for people, but it's also for cargo bikes, uh, for inner city areas to make sure that you has not to go inside with an electric car. Sometimes it's uh, necessary, but normally it's also possible to use a cargo bike with special um, um, uh, yes, aspects also to use this. It's quite easy to go, and I think that's quite important. From the people point of view, you must, you must have to offer exactly these upcoming new ideas, and you must make also quite sure that they can have the experience to do so, to make really clear that it's also fun to go by bike uh, from A to B, and it's not only really hard to go so. So I think these experience and the dialogue with workshops and with these offering uh, in special areas to make sure what is the future of mobility, I think that's quite important. And then uh, these two words will go together and the behavior of the governmental side and of course also of the people and the, the, the um, uh, inhabitants is quite clear. On that note, I think that we have to wrap up, but I think that that's a really excellent way for us to, to close out this conversation. And we hope that governments, um, city officials, national governments, international organizations that are working on this, as well as citizens, take active efforts to change their, their own mobility patterns and hope that we can um, both become healthier as individuals, but also promote a healthier planet. Thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to us today, and we hope that you've gained some uh, useful insight from this conversation about the future of urban mobility. Thank you all for joining us and for, for participating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Newton, Pertu, Harry, and Prabin for um, this conversation. It was great to follow the visions for the future of mobility with uh, you as experts from Berlin, Hamburg, and even Brussels. We're looking forward to many more of these conversations on campus. 